Okay, everybody. Um, I've got five o'clock on my clock. Um, and hopefully that's what you have on yours as well. Um, welcome to the Pierce Transit BRT webinar. Um, I'm hoping that our attendees and our panelists can all see the presentation screen that I'm sharing right now. Um, uh, here's an agenda uh, what we'll be covering tonight. My name is David Gitlin. I'm with a firm called Enviro Issues and we support Pierce Transit with this work and I'll be facilitating this meeting on a high clip tonight and um, keeping us to our agenda as best we can. Um, we've got several uh, panelists, both from Pierce Transit and Washtenaw, and also from the city of Tacoma, um, who will share an overview of the project, um, updates on design and branding, updates on the project timeline, and then um, we'll have some time for property owner um, coordination updates. And so, um, I, th I think people will introduce themselves as we go through, but um, our panel tonight, and maybe you can wave as I say your name. Um, we have Tina Lee from Pierce Transit, um, uh, Brian Walsh from Washdot, uh, Sarah Ott from Washdot as well, uh, Sean Robertson from Pierce Transit, uh, Joe Rempe from the City of Tacoma, Jesse Engel from the City of Tacoma, and Dave Rosham from the City of Tacoma. And again, I'm David Gitlin. Um, thank you all for joining. Um, so this is a Zoom meeting, as you can see. And if you're not familiar with Zoom, every meeting's a little bit different. Everybody's software is a little bit different. Um, but I'm hoping that we all um, can uh, utilize the software to the best of our abilities. So uh, you'll notice that if you are an attendee to this meeting, if you've clicked the link to show up, that right now you're muted and your video isn't showing, uh, that's intentional. Um, well, we weren't quite sure how many attendees we'd have and we want to keep the meeting manageable for everybody. So we've got things muted by default. Um, however, we are monitoring the chat function and also the question and answer feature. Um, so your question and answer box may be in a different location from somebody else's. Um, I think traditionally it's in the bottom of the screen. You'll see a little Q&A feature. So if you have questions, feel free to enter a question there. Um, and we'll, we'll highlight questions for our panel and we'll pause after each presentation section to get through Q&A. So um, even though there's a Q&A section on the agenda, I think some of those questions may be better answered in real time. Um, so our goal will be to do those um, as close to real time as, as we can do it. Um, I think that's it for uh, top of the matter. Thanks again for joining this virtual meeting. Um, we can't do them in person and, until it's safe to do so. So this is our, our best alternative. Um, and uh, thank you. Thank you for taking the time this evening. Um, with that said, uh, we'll move on to a project overview um, uh, presented by Tina from Pierce Transit. Hi, uh, thank you. And again, my name is Tina Lee. I am Pierce Transit's planning manager. And I'm going to quickly walk you through what is bus rapid transit or BRT. And it's a it's the name for a type of a new high capacity transit service that we are bringing to Pierce County. Um, think of BRT as light rail that's operated by rubber tire buses. It's a new line for Pierce Transit and a new service. And we're really excited to bring this high frequency service to Pierce County. The particular service we're going to talk about is located along the Pacific Avenue corridor or State Route 7, often referred to as SR7. And um, it's located between downtown Tacoma and Spanaway. This is Pierce Transit's Route 1 corridor. And it's um, our route that has the most riders in our system. On an annual basis, it represents about 12% of our annual ridership. And by 2040, um, we anticipate we'll be moving more than 2 million riders along this service in that quarter every year. Next slide, please. So um, BRT, BRT systems are operated um, all around the country. They're nationally, but they're also operated in um, other countries and other places in the world. But there's some standard features that you tend to see at um, most BRT systems, and I wanted to share those with you. Um, things like frequent, the buses are very frequent. They come every 10 to 15 minutes along the service. So when you're a passenger who's waiting for that next trip, 
Um, it's usually arriving within 10 minutes and you don't need a schedule and you just know that bus will be there to take you to your um, destination very quickly. They tend to be fast and um, by this we don't mean that the buses are speeding. Um, what we mean is there's um, speed and reliability improvements and um, the buses can be um, more dependent upon. There are things in the system like um, technology, uh, TSP, uh, transit signal priority at um, intersections or lights, where it may hold the, the green for a few seconds as the bus is going through or um, give bus a slight priority so those buses aren't sitting at intersections stop. They tend to be safe and reliable. They have features like lighting at every single station and um, real-time information to help passengers know when that next bus is arriving. The system's accessible. Not only are the buses accessible, and these are 60-foot articulated buses with multiple doors, so it's easier for um, individuals to board, for individuals in, with wheelchairs to board, but also if you're a bicyclist and you want to bring your bike on board, they tend to have um, bike racks inside the bus. So where some of our riders are used to going and putting their bike and a bike rack on the outside of the bus with a BRT system, um, they can carry that bike inside the bus with them. There's room and there's bike racks. And um, lastly, um, it's very easy to board the bus at stations. Um, they tend to have raised platforms, so it's in more accessible, easier to travel on to the bus. There's multiple doors. There'll be three doors on the side where that bus is pulling up to the station for faster boardings at each station, and riders pay before they actually um, ride the system. So they'll, we'll show you some uh, visuals of what the stations are going to look like, but there are ticket vending machines or worker readers, so someone pays before that bus even arrives, and when it does show up, they just quickly board and ride the service. Uh, next slide, please. So the service is really designed to support Pierce County and our local economy. Um, we know that there will be a lot more people living and working in the area as we move forward and in the next 20 years. Um, we're expecting about a 40% growth in population along the corridor and more than 80% growth in jobs along the corridor. So the service is really designed to help move these people who will be living and working along the corridor, helping get people to their jobs, to school, and just to reach their daily life activities. We're working really closely with our partners, both the City of Tacoma and um, Pierce County, to support their long-term plans and visions for the corridor. And I also want to just briefly mention um, opportunity zones. There are six um, designated zones along the corridor, which are designated to really stimulate investment in some lower income areas and communities. And six of these um, located along the route where we know the service will be able to help um, jobs and people who are living in those communities. I've mentioned the anticipated growth in ridership by 2040. And today, this section of the Route 1, again, is one of our most heavily traveled corridors. And it represents about 12% of our ridership. We tend to have about 3,400 people boarding every single weekday along the corridor. So we know that um, that ridership is going to increase dramatically with the growth that's happening and with these um, improvements in service with a higher frequency, uh, easier service to ride, and a better quality of service, as well as buses that are larger and have more seating capacity. So we'll really be able to help people move up and down that Pacific Avenue corridor to reach their destination. Uh, there will be more bus trips along the corridor, and um, those trips will have a travel time savings anywhere from 15 to 30 percent. So depending on where you board the bus along the corridor, your trip um, getting there will be faster, and that starts to make it more competitive with driving um, a car um, on, by themselves, or um, it just becomes more competitive to a car. Next slide, please. So talking a little bit about the corridor itself um, and how it operates, I wanted to tell you a bit of, more about the corridor. So this is Pacific Avenue. The map you see in front of you is the overall corridor. It's traveling north and south. It's 14.4 miles long. It starts in the south at about 208th Street in Spanaway and travels into downtown Tacoma. Some of the important things I really want to highlight about um, this map are, are the stations. So there's an oval under the legend at the top. Those represent the locations of BRT stations along the route. 
Um, we are planning to have 32 pairs of stations along the corridor. That's in comparison to 64 pairs of bus stops today along the corridor. And um, those stations are spaced apart about a third to a half a mile, very similar to what you see on a light rail um, facility. Today, when you're at one of those bus stops along the corridor, there may be a pole and a flag, and that may be the only thing that the rider has available. But with these stations, every single station will have a covered waiting area, as well as other amenities that um, we'll tell you about in just a minute. The other thing that's important to talk about um, on the corridor is today, the Route 1 does not go to the Tacoma Dome Station. And at the very top of the map, um, in this blue area, you see Tacoma Dome Station noted. That's a very important to the corridor because we know a lot of people are going to be trying to reach that area um, in the future. And uh, when they ride the BRT service and connect to services at the Tacoma Dome, um, a whole world of possibilities open up where they have access to not only other Pierce Transit local bus routes, but Sound Transit Regional Express, Regional um, Rail with the Sounder service, and then the future um, Tacoma Dome Link Extension light rail that will be coming to that location. And in addition to that, there are um, services including Amtrak and Greyhound. So it's a true multimodal hub where um, this service will provide dramatic connections and really help people be able to move in the community. The other thing I wanted to um, note is that these station locations were picked um, fairly specifically because of the location. They're areas where there's high ridership and also they're in neighborhood or business districts where we anticipate a lot of people wanting to board the system, but they're also near cross streets. And those are locations where we have other local bus routes that are crossing so that people can make connections to local service either coming or going from the bus rapid transit corridor. And then I also wanted to just talk briefly about the different treatments that we have. And the colored map or the colored boxes that are on this slide give you a sense of those treatments. Um, working from the top down, the, the dark blue represents um, a treatment where the bus rapid transit bus is in um, the right lane and mixed use traffic and the stations are also on the right side. And then the light green is what we call a business access transit lane or a bat lane. That's on the right side. It's the exclusive lane that the bus is using, but cars can get in that lane if they want to make a right turn either into a business or to a side street. Stations in that area are also on the right side. Um, orange is an area that's um, been very popular, and that is the median exclusive lane where the BRT is operating in the uh, median lane. Um, generally, it's the center turn lane that has been turned into um, a transit lane. There may be two transit lanes in some areas for buses traveling in both directions. The stations in those areas are also in the center. So um, it's, a, it's a treatment that the city of Tacoma really advocated and recommended that we move forward with the project. Um, and that's why you see a lot of that treatment here as well. And then the light blue is where the bus is operating in a left lane mixed use traffic as it's traveling between those dedicated lanes. The stations in those area are also in the center. And then lastly, I just wanted to mention the, the purple box. And this is where um, we are exploring a one lane that's bi-directional where buses can travel over um, SR 512. There's limited right of way there. So um, we're looking at a different treatment in that location. And then lastly, I do want to mention that there are these red circles at the top. There's a roundabouts. And right now our plan is proposing three roundabouts in the corridor. Those are at 121st Street. 138th Street, and then 146th Street. And we're evaluating these roundabouts and have them in the plan um, where when we work in um, DOT right away and um, we are working at an intersection, we really have to look at what's the best intersection treatment. And what we're finding is these roundabouts are um, a really good way to go in these locations. We do have um, the Washington State Department of Transportation also with us, joining us. And um, they were going to just tell you a little bit about the Washington State Department of Transportation process for evaluating intersections and um, areas that are within their um, control. And then next slide, please. Thank you, Tina. Yeah, my name is Sarah Odd. I work for WashDOT as our Olympic Region Traffic Operations Engineer. Um, and thank you, Tina. That was a great segue. Yeah, so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about 
about our policy and process. How do we uh, work together to make sure that um, this Route 1, the improvements on Route 1 are working for everybody al along the route. And so that was accomplished through a corridor-wide traffic analysis. So we looked at State Route 7 um, in Tacoma as well as in Pierce County and really looked at this holistically and individually at each intersection location. At the intersections, we used our intersection control evaluation, which is a performance-based database process to screen and evaluate intersection alternatives to really try to figure out what is the best control, just as Tina had said, what is the best control at each intersection location? Um, that could mean, is, it, is a stop control the best? Is a signal the best? Is a roundabout the best, et cetera? And we also take into account access management considering um, what's happening between intersections and how will that access management affect the operations at the intersection. So as Tina had said, there are three roundabouts um, in the plan, uh, 121st, 138th, and 146, um, and signals at the remaining locations. Next slide. And here with us is Brian Walsh as well to talk about uh, attributes of roundabouts and additional pieces of that with transit. Um, thank you, Sarah and Tina. Um, Brian Walsh with the Washington State DOT. Uh, one of the things we, we get a fair number of questions with uh, roundabout as um, intercession control and, and one of the things I, I wanted to share was uh, just some of the attributes of roundabouts. Um, roundabouts are, are a higher level um, intercession control, much like traffic signals, and it's a matter of lane arrangements. Um, they're well proven on the system. Uh, in many cases, they uh, improve travel times. One of their better attributes is handling left turns safely. Um, and efficiently, if you think about um, bus service uh, that occurs um, a number of hours of the day, not just uh, the busiest hour of the day. Um, they work well, so in peak and off-peak hours, uh, a traffic engineering term that we use. Um, uh, lower speeds at the intersections are one of our goals here uh, and why roundabouts are on the system, um, as well as the BRT system here. Um, uh, certainly assist pedestrian crossings, and it gives us a chance to do access management where we are able to get U-turn opportunities at the roundabouts. Uh, so those, those vehicles um, that wanna enter a, a fairly busy roadway are able to take right turns and U-turns to, to accomplish a left turn uh, in the proximity, uh, close proximity to the roundabout. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that maybe for the audience, um, transit, rounds, transit routes throughout the state um, have roundabouts on them um, a number of places. We know uh, Airway Heights in the Spokane area uh, we know, um, particularly in Thurston County, uh, in the uh, um, communities of uh, Tumwater, uh, Lacey, and Olympia have a number of uh, inner city uh, transit routes that go through roundabouts. And so a fairly well-proven concept um, in, in, in the reason that it's at the three locations, it looks like those three locations will be probably best utilized if a roundabout intersection control is in place. So thank you, Tina. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Um, we did get a question, uh, Tina, as you were talking. Um, and thank you, uh, David, for participating. Uh, the question was, does the project design lend itself to converting the route into light rail? Um, this may be a long-term strategy, but uh, the question is, um, could the design and main configuration be used for either uh, bus rapid transit or light rail transit in the future? Is there would need to be a lot of additional um, analysis. Um, you know, in theory, um, you could do something like that. Um, here, there could be there could be challenges because that median lane and some of those treatments aren't continuous along the whole 14 miles of the corridor. And with light rail, you would need something like that. So um, that would be a completely separate project, and um, they would have to do that additional work um, if that type of a conversion were were to be made. Okay. Thank you, Tina. And, yeah. and thank you for submitting the question. Again, a reminder that there's the Q&A feature um, that's available if you want to ask questions as we go through the presentation. Okay. Um, moving on. 
design and branding. This is you also, Tina. Yeah, so if you just want to go to the next one. Um, I did want to mention, we talked, um, I talked about the stations and um, I, I want to give you some more input at what is on a station. For, for us, that station is very important because um, it's really that element of the system that someone sees when they're, where they're coming to ride the system um, or they're trying to explore it. Um, it's the first place they're going to enter or leave that system. And it all, also um, is very visual and it really represents the system. But for us also, um, Pierce Transit has plans for more than one um, uh, station or, or system in uh, BRT corridor. And so whatever we design and um, have here on this corridor, we will have in those other um, lines as well. So some of the things that are you'll see at our stations are things like um, Orca card readers, uh, real-time uh, bus information. So when you're standing there waiting for the bus, um, you'll know is your bus arriving in five minutes or is it arriving in three minutes. Um, ticket vending machines will have those Orca card readers, but for those users who don't already have an Orca card or who want to pay another way, there would be a, a ticket vending machine of some type as well as parking for bicycles and e-scooters because we know almost every trip starts as either a walk, a bike ride, or now an e-scooter um, trip to start a transit trip. And then also I'd mentioned that the, the stations will have raised platforms, so that'll help with accessibility and uh, easier boarding, and the stations will span the entire length of the bus, and um, uh, they're bigger so that they feel safer as well. Next slide. So this is a concept that gives you a sense of what are our Pierce Transit BRT stations going to look like. And we call this concept um, suspension. We worked on a number of designs and ultimately this is what we've picked to move forward. And we feel it really does represent Pierce County and our community. And you see, um, you see some things I mentioned earlier, including the platform being the length of a bus. Um, there is a ticket vending machine called out on this very preliminary um, um, detail, as well as at the top of the um, the uh, uh, the covered area, you can see where the next bus sign is hanging. There'll be branding as well as um, seating at each of these stations. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, this is another area or, or image of that platform. You see it though in much more detail, and you see the whole length of that platform. What you also see here though are um, at each end, um, it's, kind of, it's very small yellow, but you see the um, Orca readers here. You see where a bike storage may be if someone chooses to leave their bike at the station versus taking it on the bus with them and using those bike racks inside the bus. Um, there's also the e-scooter storage, there's lighting, and um, you see the accessible boarding areas starting to be defined um, where um, it might be best to board the bus. There'll be three different doors and you start to see how they might align with the station. So this just gives you a better sense of what these stations will be like. There'll be a couple different sizes depending on um, how busy the station is going to be. And we've designed it so that it can provide maximum um, weather protection and um, keeping in mind also though that we don't think people will be at these stations very long because those buses are arriving so frequently that this isn't an area we're expecting people to congregate for a very long time. It's just waiting for that next bus to show up. Next slide, please. And then this next image shows you what the station may look like in the evening. This is um, lighting and illumination. So again, a very safe and secure area so that um, the passenger can see and also be seen. And then also trying to be careful that um, um, it's not intrusive with the lighting um, to the adjacent neighborhood. Next slide. And then um, we've talked about station design, but also branding is very important. So we keep calling this our BRT system, um, but um, we are actually going to be naming the system. And that's part of the work that we're doing right now. We're really fortunate to be working with a firm called Green Rubino. It's a marketing firm that is local, and they have experience working with um, partner agencies like Sound Transit in naming services like Link, Link Light Rail or st their Stride BRT corridor. We've been working on this for a little while and um, we have two names that are moving forward right now. And we wanted to share those. Those are Streamline and Stream. And our board will be considering those two names at their next meeting in September. So we'll be very excited after that meeting to be able to share what the name is of our system and to start uh, really branding it and communicating 
um, our new name for the system. So now I really want to turn the uh, presentation over to Sean so he can share information about the timeline with you. Um, okay, we'll do that. We just have a couple of questions and I okay. want to ask those. One um, is about roundabouts and accessibility. So going back a little bit, but Brian and Tina, this question is for you. Um, so uh, the question is, um, anecdotally, uh, this person has observed scenarios where uh, people in wheelchairs were placed at risk of vehicles whose drivers may have thought they had a right of way to not stop for anyone. Um, and also uh, a driver who first yielded as instructed, but then continued to remain stopped um, in what appeared to be a misapprehension of the intersection being an always stop and not proceeding even if they had enough clearance to go. So the overall question is what education is planned to reinforce how to properly use a roundabout? Um, and Brian and Tina, if you had any other remarks related to um, accessibility and roundabouts. Um. This is Brian uh, from the DOT, and I, I'm willing to, um, I'll, I'll take the broader question and then work towards the specific question on ADA. Uh, the broader question is, um, we, we have a website uh, at DOT dedicated to um, a, a lot of the um, rules of the road, as well as is some, some ideas of how to drive roundabouts safely, um, and some of the, the pieces that drivers need to think about, as well as pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, I have observed, I guess, Anecdotally, I've observed the, the, the behavior that this, uh, the, the, the person who had asked the question has, has asked about. Um, I think that there is certainly a, a short learning curve with uh, roundabouts and the idea that um, I have crossed a, a number of multi lanes now um, in terms of, of the ADA piece and, and a wheelchair. Um, eye contact is one of those important things. These roundabouts will be designed to uh, have a short crossing distance to a splitter island uh, on both sides so that the crossing distance is, is, is um, reduced. Um, most likely there'll be an enhanced system um, in terms of, of rapid flash system that will help um, get drivers attentions that, that a pedestrian um, able-bodied or, or disabled will be wanting to cross uh, at that pedestrian crosswalk. Um, I think from an ADA standpoint um, there is, uh, and the person who asked this question, I'm sure is well aware of this, um, ProWeg is, a, is a, a, a document that the DOT certainly um, follows. Um, it's, it's the public rights of way access guidelines. And uh, we have um, met, our roundabouts do meet those guidelines um, and, uh, and, and best practices. Thanks, David. Okay. Uh, and Tina, did you have anything that you wanted to add? I think the only thing I would add, um, as we move through the different phases of the project, one of the things that we have talked about as a, as a project team is that the communication and education and, and um, we'll have um, buses training out on the corridor before it goes live. Mm -hmm. And there'll be also work that we as, as a team will work on to help communicate that there's a bit of a change along the corridor. So that kind of work and those messages will change as we get closer to actually um, start a service. Okay, thank you, Tina. Um, two other questions uh, at this round. Um, one is, uh, will the operator have to deploy the ramp and or lift to board a wheelchair or scooters? I can answer that, uh, yes, they will. Um, there is still uh, a little bit of a ramp required for uh, boarding. Level boarding for a bus of this size is typically, you would need 15 inch curb, uh, just because of how built up this uh, corridor is. It's difficult for us to provide 15 inch curb and transition down to existing um, driveways, uh, doorsteps, et cetera. So uh, we're looking at closer to a 10 inch curve, uh, which will allow the bus to do a, a quick uh, deploy of a ramp that doesn't um, lift, it actually just um, telescopes out. So it's still a very quick way to get on the bus, uh, but there will need to be a ramp for wheelchairs still since we won't be putting in full 15 inch curve for this project. Okay, thank you, Sean. And one last question um, that speaks to our time. 
uh, is would it be possible to have socially distant seating options? Is that something that has been considered in the bus design? Something um, that we think a lot about um, as a transit agency, um, we think of everything a little differently now with um, the pandemic and um, our current situation. Um, we still anticipate that the year there will be um, more people on these buses and probably what we'll, what you'll see is that we just work differently as a transit agency with, with cleaning and communication and, and how we're operating. Um, but the idea is that, um, you know, the bus is a 60 foot bus. There is more capacity. People can spread out in that, but um, there will be times when, when they'll be fairly crowded and um, we'll, we'll assume we're past our current state um, when we're there. Okay, thank you, Tina. And uh, Sean, did you have something to add? Nope, okay. Um, and then one follow-up. Uh, this may be for Brian or for Tina or Sean. Um, uh, a question about the roundabout design. Will it include curb cuts for both wheelchair users and people walking bikes? Um, yeah, this is Brian. From, from the DOT standpoint, um, David, uh, again, from um, a peer review uh, and design review process that DOT will have as part of um, the building of these roundabouts, both of those will be um, certainly reviewed and, and, and required. Okay, great. Uh, thank you all for your questions and for your responses. So we'll move on to project timeline and Sean, um, here you are. All right, um, so yeah, Sean Robertson, I'm Pierce Transit Senior Construction Project Manager overseeing our design and construction. I'm just gonna walk you through our project timeline and so where, how we started this project and where we're going from here. Uh, so the project actually started back in 2017 when we really assessed this corridor and looked at it to see what made sense for improvements down the corridor. Uh, we looked at all options, including light rail, enhanced bat, bus service, BRT, and really found that the most economical and cost benefit ratio was to go with BRT. So we selected BRT to move forward, uh, but there was a lot of different ways that we could run a bus rapid transit line down this corridor. So in 2018, uh, we looked at uh, different alternatives and then ultimately at the end of 2018 into 2019, we uh, selected the locally preferred uh, option, which is the median lane option that we currently show you um, right now. Uh, back in 2018, we also began our FTA Small Starts grant application, which is a major funder for this project. Uh, we also conducted traffic analysis and began um, environmental review. Moving forward into 2019, we um, continued the environmental review. Uh, about this time or summer of 2019, we kicked off uh, design of this project. We were at 5% design or conceptual design last summer, and we have continued to push forward with design. This summer, 2020, we are now uh, between 30 and 60% design. Um, and uh, we will continue to move forward with the design into 2021. Uh, right now, it's looking like we will potentially break ground in summer of 2021, and then we'll be working on this project through 2023. Construction is estimated at roughly 28 months for the whole project. So that's starting all the way down in Spanaway and going into downtown Tacoma. Next slide. So a lot of questions have come up in the last six months or so about COVID-19 impacts, including questions of, is this project still going forward? So we wanted to clarify a few things with this slide. So uh, we have been slightly del delayed by COVID-19 as part of the federal process for us on a project of this size, we have to go through NEPA or that's the federal environmental process. 
Uh, we were expecting NEPA to wrap up originally in June, uh, but now we are expecting it to wrap up in late September or early October. We are expecting a DCE, um, that's a documented categorical exclusion, um, and expect that to come out in uh, potentially the end of September or beginning of October. Um, that ultimately um, is our gatekeeper for us to move forward to 60% design. So that's why we now have pushed the schedule slightly out uh, to accommodate this delay. In our original schedule, we expected to start construction in March of 2021. We have updated that to June of 2021. Uh, it's looking like we uh, will be potentially breaking ground in June or potentially a little later, but we still hope to break ground um, in summer or fall of 2021. Um, <clears throat> As mentioned before, ultimately the NEPA delay was uh, caused by COVID-19. Uh, most of the tribal organizations that we needed to have review our cultural resources reports were on furlough. Um, instead of moving forward without their consultation, um, the project was put on slight hold until uh, they reopened. Luckily, tribes have mostly come back uh, from furlough right now and we're finishing our last minute consultation with them to wrap up NEPA. Uh, as for funds go, we have no changes to the funds. Uh, we are, uh, we have secured 90 million of the budget. Uh, we actually secured that last year. Uh, we are still moving forward with funding from the FTA. Uh, I've gotten quite a few questions about why we haven't received those funds. The FTA wants to make sure that you get to a substantial part of your design um, so they can make sure that the project's real and ready to move forward. So we have to get past 60% design before we can go through a re readiness review. And at that time, um, if we uh, pass that with the FTA, we can um, finalize our funding agreement with them and receive our final funds. So. Uh, we are on track right now to be at 60% design in November. Um, we will then commence on our re readiness review after that, and we hope to receive our final FTA funding by mid to late 2021. That will complete the entire 150 million uh, funds that are required to build this project. Next slide. Yeah. Uh, before we move on, Sean, uh, we had a question that's uh, going back a little bit. Um, so the question is, um, some light rail systems that this person has used um, have a website or an app that gives real-time uh, train and vehicle location, station arrival information. Um, that was very helpful, um, letting you to know when to leave a hotel or office to catch the next, next train. Um, this may be a question for you, Tina, or you, Sean. Um, is there a um, similar online real-time location service plan for the BRT project? There um, is. Oh, go ahead, Sean. There will be re real-time signage on each one of the platforms so you can see when the next one comes. Um, ultimately, these will be coming so frequently that if you see the, if you're in the morning or afternoon, noon commute and you see the bus heading out right before you get to the platform, you know another one's coming in the next 10 minutes. So our hope is actually that you don't need to be glued to a phone to see when the next bus is coming because you'll uh, have the next one coming uh, within 10 minutes. But we will be deploying real-time signage so you'll know exactly when the next bus is coming. Um, that'll also be integrated into an app so that you can also view it on your phone. And, and I would just add, um, if someone is wanting that information, you can do that right now with our current system where um, you can go to our website, um, PierceTransit.org or the Transit app um, and some other um, apps that use our, um, our feed and you're able to get real-time information for our current system. Okay, thank you. Um, Sean, uh, property owner coordination. 
Okay, uh, I'm going to continue on and discuss property owner coordination. Um, if you want to go to the next slide here. Uh, so we often get questions about how this project may impact properties down the corridor. It's very hard with you know, a project of this size to not impact um, folks, whether it's um, from widening the right of way or from just construction activities. Uh, so we are commencing uh, a packet um, that we will be sending out uh, shortly uh, in the beginning of September. That uh, property packet uh, allows property owners to organize through an online scheduling tool and you'll be able to meet uh, at some pre-scheduled times to discuss um, potential property impacts with us. Uh, we're going to have representatives from Common Street, that's our property acquisition team, Granite, which is the general contractor, and ourselves at those meetings. So you'll not only be able to discuss uh, what impacts may this project may cause, but you'll be able to also talk to Granite and discuss traffic control and you know when potentially we will be constructing our improvements uh, near your property. Um, Common Street will also be there to discuss legal things around property acquisition. Uh, unfortunately, you know, due to COVID-19 right now, we'll be holding meetings over just the phone or virtually. If those restrictions are lifted, um, we would much rather do these in person. So um, we'll have to play it by ear now, but um, for now, uh, we're moving forward to try to reach out and work with folks. Next slide. So this is just an example of the property um, impact uh, packet that we'll be sending out. It starts with a short letter that describes where the project is and ultimately discusses what the potential impact to your property could be. Um, we also list um, options to contact us so that you can um, talk to us over the phone or virtually, um, as I mentioned before. Next slide. The packet after the uh, initial uh, letter there um, gets into some general facts on the property. Uh, you know, we have tried consistently to reach out to all folks down the corridor, but there are still some folks that haven't heard about this project. So we start the packet with just letting you know exactly what the BRT project is. And then from there, uh, next slide. And then from there, we really um, uh, spell out our message to property owners and go over um, what we may need. Um, there are two main um, things that could come up that will impact your property. There's temporary construction easements or TCEs. Uh, those are needed in the case that we need to rebuild a wall or sidewalk right on the property line. Um, in that case, we may need to put some forms or uh, stage things just over the property line in order to get that built. It doesn't mean that Permanently, we're going to be on your property, but it does mean that we need a um, access or temporary access to your property. Um, those will be treated just like full property acquisitions. Uh, we won't be accessing anyone's property without their permission. Uh, so I wanted to voice that and, and then also uh, just go over um, the options that we'll be giving you. Um, uh, to, to move forward with us, with us uh, on the property acquisition piece here. So uh, let's take a look at the next slide. So this slide really goes over the purchase. And when I say purchase, um, I wanted to make sure everyone was aware that it doesn't mean that we're purchasing all properties. About half of the property impact packs are TCEs or temporary construction easements. Uh, for those, we could potentially need access for a week, uh, maybe upwards of a month, uh, but we will negotiate the terms, the times, and the cost with you for those. Um, so this uh, part of the packet goes over um, the purchase pro process and just goes over high-level facts. 
Uh, it was impossible for us to get all the details in this packet, um, but again, um, we're asking all folks that receive these to reach out to us so that you can talk to the experts. Um, we brought on Common Street uh, because they've done a lot of projects similar to this and they know all the rights and details to um, how a project like this moves forward. So then the final uh, part of this packet here goes over your rights. Um, there's a lot of data here um, that I'm not going to go into detail about, um, but a common thing that comes up is um, we will appraise your property if we think there's going to be an impact on it. And sometimes we don't come to agreement on how much that property is worth. So in that case, um, on the upper right hand side of this, um, we do have a, um, a bullet point on what if you feel Pierce Transit offer is too low. In that case, um, if you do feel like our offer is too low, uh, we give you some reimbursable, reimbursable uh, costs to go out and get your own appraisal for the property. Um, so you know that we aren't um, specifically trying to um, lowball or, or give you a, um, a cost that's lower than you deserve. So um, we're committed to working with everyone and um, you know, really coming to agreement with you. The most important part of this though is we want to know more about your property. Uh, as mentioned before, we're between 30 and 60% design. Uh, we have the chance now to accommodate um, impacts. So if you have two driveways and one of them you don't use and one of them you get deliveries every month or every week, those are the things we want to hear. If you have a wall or a fence that you want to keep, if you have land, special landscaping, that's important to you. Those are the things that we want to hear so we can try to accommodate those uh, before we finalize our construction plan. So the last slide here that I'll show you um, is one of the most important parts of this packet that will be um, going out soon. This allows you to respond to us so that we can set up that video or phone conversation. I think we do say in person on there, but um, that'll be um, available if um, the option uh, to do so is, is lifted. Uh, this here um, is important for everyone to respond to because like I said before, we really want to work with property owners, understand how you access your property, what's important to you so that we can try to make mitigations now to impact your property um, less. So with that, um, on top of the high level property impacts we see from widening the right of way, there could um, be some other potential uh, impacts down the corridor, mostly with utilities. So I'm gonna hand it over to Tacoma Power and they are going to go over a little bit about relocating poles and what that may look to you. Thanks, Sean. Yes, uh, my name is uh, Joe Rempe. I am an engineer with uh, Tacoma Power. I uh, work uh, on poles and wires that are up and down the streets. Um, and um, I'm also here with uh, Dave Rosholm. He is an account executive. Uh, his job is to coordinate uh, our activities with you and specifically with the business side of, the, of um, our customers. But uh, he and his team uh, work closely with the business community as we work along the roads. And uh, for those who are uh, commercial folks, uh, oftentimes when we take outages, it's a Dave or one of his team members that contacts you and asks you about what time is the best time uh, to take that outage and also to explain what our crews are going to do. So uh, between Dave and I, we'll tag team on this and uh, we'll go forward. So we are working with Pierce Transit. We've been working with them since December. Uh, we serve uh, electrical customers in the city of Tacoma, uh, Spanaway and Elk Plain. Uh, within the Parkland area, there are two other utilities there. Uh, impacts to road widening. As uh, Pierce Transit 
um, more fully utilizes the physical limits of the right of way uh, and along, which means sidewalks essentially are getting pushed to the edge of right of way or onto what is now private property. Our facilities are also going to be moved. And at this time, we've counted up about 175 poles and the wire that's attached to them uh, will have to have some form of adjustment. Um, when we do, and it's, it looks to be that all of our poles will have to go behind uh, the new sidewalks that are being poured. Uh, and that will put us in private property, which is currently private property. And when we do that, we would go for easements on private property that would allow us to be there. Uh, and that would not only be for the poles themselves, but it would also be, be for the wire that they support. Um, as the work is done, uh, oftentimes we do have to take power outages and so that the work can be done safely. And again, we'll work with uh, businesses and homeowners on scheduling of those outages. And oftentimes these are done at, on the weekends or at nights. Um, and then, uh, there may be some additional work for those who do have underground services. It's just uh, kind of the physical nature of what we have to do with underground, but we will work with you on that. So um, as far as the timing, uh, Tacoma Power's work may start as much as one year prior to Pierce Transit's contractor. And that really has to go with us having to set our poles, move the wire, and then once Tacoma Power is done, then you have all of the communication providers that are attached to our poles. They are also uh, having to relocate. So it's a it's a step-by-step -step process, and at the end, uh, the poles are removed, and uh, Pierce Transit's contractor will be able to um, perform their work. Next slide. So we were talking about, you know, poles and moving. This is an example uh, near the 84th uh, intersection of Pacific Highway where our existing pole is out there uh, on the road side of the uh, current sidewalk, but with the improvements, uh, that pole would have to move what looks like onto private property right there. That's where the uh, traffic cone is. Um, and then we can go to the next slide. Uh, it's just another example where uh, that pole gets a lot closer to the, to the bank. So these are just a couple examples uh, that could occur. Uh, and when we get into areas where uh, we are truly in conflict with uh, buildings and homes, uh, we will look at all of our options uh, at that point. So uh, anything else you wanna add, Dave? Only uh, just to reinforce what you said, Joe, about the fact that we want to work with all the property owners and business owners on an individual basis, um, kind of echoing what Sean said, we want to learn about the, the property and the situation so that we, we're not throwing blanket solutions or timelines out at, at people. We're really working with everyone to, to find a, uh, you know, some harmony in what we're doing, both in the timing of the work and, and the, the placement of the polls, et cetera. So um, that's, that's our practice and that's what we're going to going to engage in on this project as well. Okay. Thank you, Dave. And Jesse, I believe this is your slide. Yes. So my name is Jesse Angel with Tacoma Water. And much like Tacoma Power, um, we have a lot of water main and services and hydrants along this corridor that will be affected by this project. So we've, we've reviewed the plans as kind of they sit right now. And we don't believe that the platforms are going to be affecting any of the water mains that are existing right now but we need to evaluate that because obviously if the platform is there it does prevent our crews from getting access to the water main if they need to do maintenance so that part of the process will we'll review that as we move along with the plans and kind of figure out what is needed in those situations off the top of my head it was probably it really was a small amount of the stations that actually affected the water main. So we'll be reviewing those as this design move forward. The main impact was to the water height or water services and the fire hydrants along this corridor, mainly the water services, much like the um, 
power poles that Joe was just talking about, our services are located generally in the planter strip, which is generally between the, the curb and the sidewalk. And in a lot of these cases, they're pushing the sidewalk back, which means that our meter would be in the road. And so we'll need to relocate those. Um, this is gonna be an impact for the property owners. Most of them would appear to be staying still within the right of way, but it will have an impact to the customer because we, when we do move these, we will have to shut off your water service. Generally, it's anywhere from you know four hours to eight hours during the day where we would shut off the water to make these connections and move these. You still have water and we can, there are alternative ways where we can highline you to keep you in water and stuff like that. So there's ways we can look to work with the property owners. It's also a good opportunity as we're working through this process to make sure that the water service you have is what you ultimately need. It's a good opportunity if you're choosing to upgrade, you can work with us and we can come up with prices for upgrading your water services save you some money kind of going in with the construction of the processes but the hydrants that will be affected were mostly at the intersections and a lot of these hydrants we're gonna just need to physically move back in a similar manner with the, um, the poles and the water services to get them out of the improvement area this work also would happen prior to first transit's work because once again, we need to have our facilities out of the way to lessen the impacts to them and kind of get everything out of the way so that's not happening. And at this point, this work is anticipated to be done by Tacoma Water Crews. And that I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Jess. Oh, go ahead, Dave. David, if I could add anything. Um, are the Tacoma water crews have been performing similar work on uh, Martin Luther King Way uh, for the Sound Transit Link Extension, moving a lot of services. And, and what I've been very impressed with is the, the amount of time and uh, outreach that we've been doing to all of the customers to make sure that this work is being done on a schedule that works for them, you know, taking into consideration what their, their needs are in terms of the water. Um, it's, it's really a, a concentrated effort and that's, uh, that's what we plan to do here as well. <clears throat> Thanks, Dave. Uh, question just came in about utility services. Um, so Dave, Joe, Jesse, however you'd like to answer this. Um, will utility services be ramped up to accommodate potential for zoning changes, mixed use, or additional density? Well, for uh, Tacoma Power, we don't typically uh, alter a service unless the customer uh, needs it, uh, and we generally don't put in equipment such as uh, transformers ahead of time either. Um, that's we usually wait to see what the customer needs. Um, the lines that go along Pacific themselves are, for the most part, what we call feeder. It's a, a large capacity lines. So for if you're building a building or uh, utilizing your property, uh, we would have sufficient electrical capacity for you. But uh, individual services themselves, uh, uh, we wouldn't be changing that unless the, the customer asked. And I, water might have a different answer though. So we're gonna have a similar answer. We don't generally upgrade things for, um, those are paid for by customers as they need to improve them. So like I said, if, if you determine that you need a future service, it would be a perfect opportunity to potentially save some money to upgrade it as this project comes through. But once again, that cost would be borne by the property owner. Um, we do have most of our mains along this corridor are sized in a way that they can support the current zoning and a lot of the future zoning that's there and if they if anything needs to be done then they would have to be done at the cost of the property owner i would just add that one thing that we did too um along martin luther king way for the sound transit link extension work was 
reach out to uh, property managers and owners of uh, even empty properties ahead of time to see if they planned any work or expansion or construction so that while we were doing our work, we could, we could perform that work as well without having to, to maybe uh, disrupt a moratorium and, and rip up the, the, the area again. So um, that will be part of our effort this time, I'm sure. Okay, thank you, Dave. I add on to that really quickly from yes. standpoint. Uh, so due to our um, FTA funding and, and local state funding, um, we have quite a bit of restrictions on what we can pay and not pay for. So um, I, we have received some questions about are my rates going to go up. I just wanted to clarify that Pierce Transit plans on paying for every relocation that we cause from this project. That being said though, we unfortunately are restricted from paying for upgrades. We can replace in kind, uh, but we can't upgrade. Uh, but that being said, I don't wanna put a bunch of improvements down the corridor and have them ripped up down the road. So to mirror what Dave mentioned, um, you know, as part of the reach out that we're doing now, or um, as part of this, we, we just ask folks to start reaching out to us and working with us or the city uh, because we can accommodate some improvements. Um, it may not be born uh, cost-wise by us, uh, but we definitely want those improvements to get in now so that we don't have to rip up new asphalt, concrete, and cause disruptions down the road. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Um, there are no incoming questions at this time, but I'm gonna talk slowly because I know sometimes it takes some time to type them out. Um, there is an announcement from um, Julian Wheeler, who was a participant um, and still is. So uh, Julian, I'll, re I'll read your announcement now. And then I think once I, I answer this question, it gets saved for everybody to see. Um, so Julian um, uh, just has a public announcement uh, that all are invited to uh, attend the next regular session of the Pierce County Accessible Communities Advisory Committee. That's online on Tuesday, September 8th at 9 a.m. Um, they're looking for new ideas, new members and speakers for meetings um, and can help fund accessibility projects from the State Accessible Communities Act of 2010. If you're interested, you can email Julian F. Wheeler at AOL.com. Um, and again, once I click that's answered, uh, all of that will be um, viewable by all attendees. Um, so uh, I'll give a moment to see if any other questions pop up. Um, in the meantime, I, I just look to the panel. Is there anything else that you thought that, boy, I wish I had said that five minutes ago that you want to share now? I think I would only add, um, I don't think we mentioned it, but we have our our project website at ridebrt.com and we try to keep that very current. So if um, individuals are looking for information about the project, that website ridebrt.com is a place to go and it also has ways to contact us on the project team if you have questions or um, want more information from us. Thank you. Yeah. That's a great point, Tina. And also on the ridebrt.com is a, uh, a link to a virtual open house um, a different kind of virtual open house. It's a, it's a website that was launched some time ago, but has uh, a lot of the information that Sean and Tina have reviewed um, and some opportunities for feedback as well. So um, if you wanna look at some of this content in more detail, that would be the place to go. Um, and I think uh, we'll eventually post this presentation to the website as well. Great. Okay. Well, we are holding the next half an hour for questions, and if there aren't any, we can break. Um, so I just do want to honor that uh, some folks may need a little bit more time to prepare questions. So um, thank you for bearing, bearing with us and holding that space. Um, and for those of you who are getting ready to sign off or are signing up, thank you for your attendance. Um, we'll just sit here for another couple of minutes and see if any questions pop.
Oh, okay. Um, here's a question that came up. Um, uh, it is, uh, what are the names being considered? And I'm assuming that this is referring to um, the, the line, uh, the service names. Um, Tina, do you want to speak to that again? Yes, um, for uh, the BRT system name, there are two, two different names that are moving forward, and we're taking those to our Board of Commissioners at their September board meeting. But the two names are Streamline and Stream. Thank you, Tina. I hope that answered that question. And if it didn't, feel free to follow up. We'll just give it a, one more minute and then we can adjourn. Um, there, just in case you're at your computer and looking for where the Q&A section is, there should be a little Q&A icon on your toolbar. It shows two um, question boxes or two comment boxes. I'm not sure how you say that. I mean, comic book word balloon, that's the word. Uh, two word balloons, it says Q&A. Um, so that's where you would submit those questions. And again, thank you to everybody who's participated so far. Okay, well, I feel that like that was ample time. Um, this presentation uh, will be posted, um, or this video will be posted to YouTube. So um, if you want to enjoy this again, you're welcome to do so. Um, and again, it's uh, ridebrt.com is a project website. You can email the team at brt at piercetransit.org and um, someone will follow up with you. There's a project phone number and then also property info line those numbers are both um, on the screen ahead of you the property info line was is your um, connection to the um, property team for this project and so if you have property that is um, likely to be impacted by the project that's a good number to, for for you to have um, i see that our attendees are saying goodbye um, so i'll share that goodbye thank you all for joining and enjoy the rest of your august evening Goodbye, everyone.